Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Tester Auto channel. Now over the years, in my capacity as a reviewer, I have read a lot of fiction. And one of the things I've noted is the sad decline of the short story. It used to be such a major part of science fiction and fantasy, now not so much. But, it's too early to write its obituary, and I think the short story has an increasingly important role to play, once again, in the world of fiction. So, as I promised, I was previously talking about the top 10 steampunk anthologies. This time, I'm going to do my top 10 picks for the steampunk short stories. So, as I said last time when I was talking about the anthologies, it was so difficult to pick these. There were so many out there. And it was easier for me just to go back through the anthologies and remember which ones I had liked the most and which ones had made the biggest impression on me. That's one of the more important aspects of the short story. Because it's so short and because there's not much time to make an impression, the impression that the author does make on you is what sticks with you. And the stories you remember are, by definition, often the best ones. Now, before I get started, I want to do a couple other things. First of all, in the previous thing about the anthologies, I talked about an ebook called Steampunk Prime, which was not real steampunk, it was actually Victorian authors, uh, and they were unknown Victorian sci-fi authors, which made it so cool and a very interesting selection. And here it is in hardcover form. And it's called, it's got a different title, it's called The Extraordinary Tales of Victorian Futurism, Steampunk. Uh, this is the same book. It's edited by Mike Ashley. I actually ordered this accidentally. I thought, oh, that looks beautiful. And I didn't realize that I had already read it. But the cool thing about it is that it is, the typesetting is wonderful. You like these, you know, the pages. They've got the little color on the edges and illustrations. So it really is a great addition to my library, even though I've already read it. And even though it's not actually steampunk, <laughs> technically speaking. The other thing I wanted to say is that I have been rearranging my office. I know it's a disaster and it will remain a disaster, but I have arranged, rearranged the tables that sit in front of me as I do this. And one of the things you may notice is that you can see this prompter. <laughs> I'm going to fix that, but right now I don't have time to fix that. I have to get this recorded. So please bear with me. So as I said, this time I'm going to do the top 10 steampunk short stories. I did not consider things that I thought of as multimedia, like uh, stories that included graphics, kind of like the illustrations in there, but things where the stories where the graphics were actually a primary or fundamental part of what they were. There were several like those in Anne and Jeff Vendermeer's second steampunk anthology, Steampunk 2, or Steampunk Reloaded, I believe it was called. And there's another cool one that was S36, The Call Girl, which was by Bonsart Bokel, which combined graphics and comics and so on with text. I'm not going to consider that because I consider that like apples and oranges. And if I ever get to going into multimedia uh, steampunk anthologies, okay, I might include them in there. But without further ado, let's get into my top 10 steampunk short stories. Number 10, The Mech Oni and a Three Inch Tinkerer by Leslie and David T. Allen. This is from the Clockwork Fairy Tales series. There's several of these volumes out there. They're all very short. They're all very digestible. Not all of the stories within are all that good. A lot of them, they, they throw in gears and uh, mad scientists and so on and airships and call it steampunk. Not that they're horrible stories, but not the most imaginative. This was one of the exceptions. Uh, this was a adaptation of Japanese folklore and as you know I love manga and and anime and so this was very cool. Uh, it's about a character called Isen Boshi, uh, the one inch boy. In this case he was three inch boy. I guess he had to kind of work on the scale and he's like their equivalent of Tom Thumb and he was born to this childless couple and and he eventually ends up dealing with his terrible small size and going on adventures. In this case, he becomes the world's smallest samurai. He's got like a needle for a sword and so on. 
and like a coin for a shield. In this particular story, he has to battle a mechanical ogre, uh, which they would call an oni. Their folklore is a little different than ours, but roughly analogous to like an ogre or a monster. It's, it's a lot of fun, and it reoccurs within this Clockwork Fairy Tale series, so you're going to see more than one installment, which was, which was very good because this was one of my favorites. Number nine, Trouble in an Hourglass by Jody Lynn Nye. This is one of those weird Western stories that I talked about last time. And whereas you might not call it steampunk, it's pretty much the same thing. It's a modified historical setting, and you add in things like the supernatural or time travel in this case, or other, you know, wacko kind of Victorian style inventions, and makes it very different and unique. In this case, we've got a saloon girl that they all call Trouble. Her real name's Carrie Lynn or something like that, but they call her Trouble because she's gorgeous, and she is also very smart. <laughs> so she's double trouble, and her father's one of these mad scientists, and he's invented a time machine, which gets stolen by the bad guys and gets involved in the most complicated stagecoach robbery ever, where, where things happening out of order. And so it's got all those elements of a western adventure plus the steampunk weirdness with time travel, so I really enjoyed it. Number eight. You might not have heard of this, and this might be a little harder to find, though I'm pretty sure it's still on Amazon. It's called Air Fleets Over Ostend by J.P. Medved. It's part of a Clockwork Imperium series of short stories that he published in a single ebook volume. I met this guy in a libertarian sci-fi writers group, and I really ended up enjoying some of his work. He's done other stuff besides steampunk, but don't think he's done any steampunk recently, unfortunately. These are a lot of fun. These involve three soldiers in the Royal Army in the 1800s and their adventures and misadventures as they uh, defy orders, but somehow don't get in too much trouble because they end up being heroes and, and doing heroic things. And then Henry, James, and Rahim, the third guy, is a Sikh that they met in India and became good friends with him. And he's kind of he's kind of their muscle because he's a big guy, and also he's a little bit of a well they're all kind of funny but but he's afraid of heights which makes it this airship <laughs> this airship adventure kind of a troubling one for him. Anyway, in this one they help put down a Flemish rebellion in Bel Belgium, and I don't think there's any historical uh, precedent for this, but of course we can modify history, right? And so these guys are fun, and I like this the best out of the three stories in this particular volume because it had the most military action and uh, danger in battle in it. Number seven, Bell Coggins Scandal by R. Rosakis. I mentioned this last time. It's part of the Clockwork Chaos anthology and I love the title. It's kind of a pun. Sometimes I hate titles that are puns depending upon if the cliche is too overworn. And in this case, I gave it a pass because it's a little bit more creative. Bell is, of course, one of the names of the characters. <laughs> Evangeline Bell, a rare female scientist in the 1800s. And she is kind of embattled because men don't want to take her seriously, of course, but she's invented this really cool, uh, it's really cool device. I, th I think it's for propulsion or something of a an airship. And I know it involves airships. And when she in intends this party at the house of a lord who's like, scientist himself and he sponsors other scientists. She's feeling very much of an outsider because all the women think she's dorky and the men don't take her seriously but it turns out that she gets embroiled in this scientist duel which is a fun concept. As, as the scientists were battling each other with their inventions the British government said okay we're gonna formalize this called the duel and there's these rules and you can kill each other during the duel. Just keep other people out of the way. So she gets involved in this struggle to complete this airship and battle this other rival scientists, which is which is great adventure, I must say. Number six, Lady Witherspoon's Solution by James Morrow. And this is one of the major steampunk collections. I think this was in the Vandermeer one, or it might have been in the in the uh, Mammoth book. I don't recall which one. I'll, I'll put it on the screen. It's basically written as a journal. Well, as two different journals. 
there, there's a sea captain. He's exploring the southern polar regions, and they encountered this bizarre colony of what seemed to be Neanderthals. And they can't figure out where these people came from, but they're friendly at least, even though they can't really talk. And, and as they're puzzling the uh, mystery, one of them produces, one of the Neanderthals that is, produces a book written in English, a journal of a woman called uh, Kitty Glover. And this kind of helps to explain well, how these people came about and it's kind of disturbing, which is why it stuck with me. Number five, Victoria by Paul D. Filippo, or Filippo, I'm not sure which. He had a lot of the short stories and a lot of the anthologies that I mentioned last time. And uh, some of them are, well, they're all pretty good, but some of them are a little bit edgy, let's say. In some cases they do deal with controversial subjects like the scientific racism of the Victorian era, although I think he exaggerates a bit, and there's a lot of weird sexuality in them too. <laughs> and this one's no exception. In this one, the Queen Victoria disappears, and the so the Empire is like really upset. What are we going to do? We can't let the public know. We have to have a substitute for her. So instead of just finding a double, <laughs> which would be the easy thing, they find this mad scientist who can develop a clone out of a salamander. <laughs> yes, a human-sized salamander who looks like a woman. She can't really talk, but she can walk around and do, you know, she can wave to crowds and stuff and do kind of a good approximation of Victoria. And it's bizarre because she's got these weird needs. She has to have her skin kept moist and she has weird sexual appetites. <laughs> but they do eventually find Victoria who's gotten tired of reigning and decides to go out and help the women of her country. You know, she's working at a, I think she's working at a battered women's shelter or something like that. So, kudos to her. They actually portray Victoria as a positive character. A lot of these books portray her as a bit of a villain, and so I like this for a change. Number four, Tanglefoot by Sherry Priest. She's one of the leading lights in steampunk. Not so much now. I, I think she's gotten into other stuff because steampunk wasn't as popular with publishers. I've gone over that, and I'll probably talk more about that because... <laughs> Uh, it's weird. The mainstream publishers really don't like steampunk so much. Uh, ah, colonial and all that garbage. But in her heyday, in the 2010s, 20-teens, uh, Sherry Priest wrote some really great novels in the Clockwork Century series, which is an alternate past of the U.S. The Civil War lasted a lot longer, and there were all these weird uh, technical innovations, and also a zombie plague in Seattle. It's scientifically explained, mind you. But in this one is a, just a short story about an orphan who lives in the sanitarium. You know, doing because of the long war, there's a lot of orphans, there's a lot of you know injured vets and so on. And he befriends a, a scientist, an elderly scientist, who's kind of befuddled. He, he's kind of suffering from dementia. And this scientist noted, notes that he doesn't have any friends, so he helps him create his own friend, <laughs> rather, than, <laughs> rather than doing it the usual way. So he creates this automaton, who turns out to be a little bit more trouble than, than he'd expected. Number three, 72 Letters by Ted Chang. I talked about him in my previous show. He's one of those leading lights in science fiction now, one of those rising stars. I guess he's already risen, because he's got one of his... Short story has been made into a major movie. Uh, that was Arrival. But in this case, he was dealing with some folklore. The, he kind of bends in a weird way into some very good steampunk. It's kind of cultural appropriation because he's Chinese and he likes Western folklore, right? <laughs> in this case, it's Kabbalah. It's a Jewish mysticism that allows these uh, alchemists, alchemist rabbis, to create a golem, uh, which is almost always like a sorcerer's apprentice type deal because the golem, if you're not very, very careful, can often turn on his creator. In, in specific combinations, the Hebrew alphabet can be used to create special spells. It'll create a golem or other things. In this case, we have this British youngster who is dabbling in it and he becomes a scientist, an alchemical scientist, goes to university and he discovers this horrible secret, this horrible thing that spells certain doom for the human race <laughs> because reproduction is kind of the way that they assumed in in the old times that that uh, 
human beings were in tiny form contained in sperm. <laughs> it's a little, little creepy, but it's, it's a very great twist on this old folklore. Number two, Queen Victoria's Book of Spells by Delia Sherman. I talked about this. This is the title story for that anthology in the previous review. And I love this because it was about Victoria, once again. And it's told, it's a double story. It's told from the viewpoint of a researcher who is investigating the childhood of Victoria in this really restrictive library in, the, in Windsor Castle. And we also read Victoria's journal and we hear about her sad and isolated youth, her struggles as they're teaching her magic and spells. And we also find that she used a love spell to have Albert fall in love with her, which she later regretted. But what I really enjoyed about this was the afterword, because in this anthology, like in a lot of those, they have the author comment. And, and Sherman comments about why she loves the Victorians because of all their contradictions. You know, they're, they're selfish and generous. They're uh, conservative and reckless. <laughs> they're uh, you know, ruthless and principled all at the same time. And, and I think that's why a lot of us steampunks love this era and that, that very fascinating people, uh, the Brits of the 19th century. Number one. I read this recently, so I may have a little bias here, but... It's involved in a series that I really, really love, and I've talked about before, and, and it's called A Dead Gin in Cairo by P. Jelly Clark. And this is a prequel to Clark's 2021 novel, A Master of Gin, which is set in Egypt in 1912. So it's kind of an Egyptian steampunk. And this is an exception to the usual rule that modern mainstream publishers, I believe it's Tor in this case, that they hate steampunk because Clark is black. So he gets a pass, which is good for us because at least we have some steampunk out there, right? And, and he's a fantastic writer. And this is a cool premise. There is a sorcerer named Alja Hees who came out in the mid-1800s who opened the veil between the natural world and the supernatural world and it let all these jinn and angels and other spirits and magical creatures in. And this was in Egypt so it affected Egypt the most. And Egypt became the world power. They were able to drive the colonizers out and become a leading country on the world stage. But the fun thing about this in particular is the protagonist, who is very memorable. Uh, she is a female investigator called Fatima. And she is in the Ministry of Alchemy, Enchantments, and Supernatural Entities. <laughs> <laughs> very cool, and it's very challenging to be a female investigator in an Islamic society. In this book, uh, the Islamic societies aren't quite as strict and humorless and anti-female as they've become under the unfortunate uh, wash of oil money from the fanatical Saudis. So I liked that view. I wish this alternate, this alternate uh, past had come to pass. Uh, but anyway, so Fatima is unusual in that she's a woman, for one thing. She doesn't wear a veil or anything like that. She dresses like a man, which is the most shocking. She wears an elegant, tailored British suit and a bowler hat. And she carries a cane, which is partly a weapon, of course. And she's also a lesbian, by the way. <laughs> uh, but she's a very fun and engaging character, and she has to solve mysteries like involving conspiracies with these jinn and so on. A jinn dies in this story, which is very unusual since they're immortal. And one of the other great things, I listened to this, the audiobook form of this and the Master of Jinn, which is the first in uh, Clark's novel series. And the narrator is a woman called Sulea El Atar. I'm probably butchering her name, but she has the most gorgeous voice. A very exotic very sexy, and, and I could listen to her all day. I really could. So that's another reason why I gave this the number one spot. Or those are my top ten. They may not be the most exhaustive picks. I may have forgotten some that were equally good. Uh, my apologies for that. And I may have left some out that I should have included. But oh well. Please let me know what you think about this in the comments below. Please 
give me any suggestions for other things I should check out, in particular anthologies. I'm discovering them all the time. And please like and subscribe. That helps us get out the good steampunk word and spread it and keep steampunk as a genre from dying. So for now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.